Good evening. I'm Sean Gale, Assistant City Manager and City Spokesperson here at the City of Miramar. Thank you for joining us for the fourth edition of our bi-weekly series, Conversations with Mayor Messam. Today we're discussing a topic that I'm sure is on the minds of most parents, and that topic is education. And as we go through a COVID-19 situation, we know that we have different challenges that we face here um, in our local communities. And so we know students have been through some challenging times recently, especially being stuck at home. They've been dealing with homeschooling. They've missed out on socializing with friends and playing sports and, and such activities. So we have today with us uh, Dr. Robert Renzi, who is the superintendent of Broward County Public Schools. Under Mr. Renzi's leadership, Broward County Public Schools became the first district in the United States to receive the Cambridge District of the Year distinction. Also under his leadership, high schools in the district consistently ranked among the best in the nation by US News and World Report. We also have today none other than President Gregory Hale. He's a president president of now he's a graduate from Columbia University School of Law, received his bachelor's degree from Arizona State University. And he also teaches higher education law and, and policy uh, at Harvard University. Now, this panel, along with our Mayor Mesa, will be answering your questions during the presentation this afternoon. So please go ahead and type them in our comment section and we'll get the conversation going. Right now, I'll turn over to our Mayor, our Mesa, our Mayor, Mayor Mesa. I'm glad that you are finding these sessions valuable and that you continue to tune in and support us each week here at the city of Miramar with conversations with Mayor Wayne Messam. I'm very happy to have these two gentlemen join us today and for taking time out of their very busy schedules to share updates with us that we are all so eager to hear about. We are so proud of our teachers and students who've had to adapt fairly quickly to distance learning. I've heard from many parents who have nothing but praises for our teachers, especially after these parents suddenly had no choice but to play the teacher role from home. So hats off to the school board and to our wonderful teachers for keeping our students engaged remotely for the past two months. Our teachers truly are our local heroes. And I just got word today that the governor of DeSantis signed the the bill that actually is going to increase the teacher's pay. So we're really excited about that. You know, ever since announcing the education format for tonight's episodes, I've received a lot of questions regarding the convening of school in August. Parents are very anxious on what the future looks like and will our school campuses be safe? Mr. Runcy, I see that the school board received a lot of feedback from more than 80,000 parents, guardians, teachers, staff, and students who provided input on what reopening of schools should look like in the fall. Can you expand on that and tell us about the hybrid staggered day model being considered? Yes, and, and uh, thank you for opening up um, with a recognition of the work um, that our teachers and staff have had to do literally within less than two weeks had to pivot our entire educational system from in-person on campus, in classroom, to virtual. That was not an easy feat. Um, there was some amazing work that was done out there. And we also know we had some challenges um, that we've learned from, and that's gonna make us much better as we go into the new school year. Um, you know, this um, is a challenging uh, and collaborative process that we're trying to do. There are no easy decisions or clear options. However, what I'll tell you, what is clear is there are two highest priorities have to be one, the health um, and safety of our students and our employees, and number two, providing a consistent high quality education to all students across the system. Um, the ultimate decisions around this are gonna be made by parents. So we've reached out on two surveys so far, and we're gonna issue a third one starting this Monday and maybe as early as this weekend that I wanna talk about um, briefly. And first, I'll just, uh, I bring up the results of the latest survey that we did asking for um, preferences on reopening options. And let me just share that with you um, right now. All right, so can you see that? 
Yes. Yeah, so this, um, so we did a survey and the response was, you know, over the period of eight days, we had over 80,000 responses, as you can see, 71% of them were actually our parents uh, and guardians. So that was a, um, a big deal of the input. And we also heard from teachers um, and students as well. Uh, the, from the parents, we see that about a quarter of the, of the parents said, Hey, I, I, I'm going to continue with online e-learning from home. And there are a number of reasons for that, right? We have um, parents who have told me that they don't feel comfortable um, until, you know, they see this uh, pandemic subside, until a vaccine's available. Um, they may have uh, live in a multi-generational household and they're concerned uh, not only for their students, but even, I mean, their young ones, but even more so. Uh, for the other adults that live, um, you know, under that roof. Um, so that's about a quarter of the families. The rest of them, and you could prove it this way, 75% ultimately want to spend time in school. And the largest percentage, 36%, want schools fully open back to the way they were before. Um, and then there's about 33, another third, who indicated um, they're looking for uh, a blended uh, model. Um, you know, what's not clear, and I wouldn't say that those who want a, a blended, I'm sorry, a full, a fully reopened option, if that's not available, would they go to um, a blended model or not? And that's, that's not clear. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, here's the results from teachers and staff and students. And you see they're all pretty much um, the, the same in terms of how they, they, they fall out. So this information has been pretty uh, informative. Um, and what we are planning to do now um, is to move forward and do another survey that we'll issue um, again Monday. And it will go from Monday all the way to um, July 9th. And we're trying to get this information at a local school level so we can determine school by school what those preferences are. Uh, ultimately, this work is about balancing a number of competing priorities and constraints. Uh, number one, there's equity where we have to make sure that every student, uh, regardless of their situation, is receiving a high quality educational experience. Uh, we know that there are students, for example, who um, some of our special needs students, are what we call our exceptional um, student education students, uh, require direct services in classroom, there are some services that you just can't deliver uh, remotely. Um, so we have to prioritize those students as well as our early learners in pre-K to third grade. We know that's a group that needs a lot of um, interaction. Uh, the second thing we look at is opportunity where everyone needs to have an opportunity to be on our campuses and to um, get the experiences they need. Uh, we have students, for example, in our secondary that are in certification programs through our career and technical education where they need hands-on experiences to actually meet their certification requirements. They got to balance all that with um, health and safety and wellness, uh, following um, guidelines and protocols that are recommended and encouraged. And we know that we're going to have to be as flexible as possible because this school year will be like no other school year. It's going to have its ups and downs, its ebbs and flows, and all of that is going to be um, determined by the status of the um, pandemic. So um, we we want to be able to uh, be able to go and, and address uh, all of that. So we have a survey that's going out, um, and it's going to look at a number of um, options that we're going to ask uh, families to to give us some input on. And so um, I, we know that we're going to continue to have an e-learning option. This is where, again, for that quarter of the families who said, I, I want to continue e-learning from home, we're absolutely going to do that and connect it to the local school. That's very different than the 9,300 students that typically enroll annually in what we call Broward Virtual School, which is a totally online um, system as well. And then there's going to certainly be a third option in there, and that's we're really going to try to get a gauge for the appetite of parents to send their kids to school 
on a full-time basis, five days a week, um, notwithstanding what may be out there in terms of the challenges, right? So we're gonna try to get some gauge on that and have a, and the other thing I would say is that there's a important conversation that's gonna occur. Um, it's gonna be our third conversation with our school board and it's gonna be next Tuesday, um, June 30th, and it's gonna cover this topic. Um, so again, there's a survey that's going out. We need the um, community to uh, respond to that and provide feedback. And that's gonna help us to understand what your intentions are for your local neighborhood school. Then we have our school board workshop on Tuesday in which we're gonna discuss the options even further. And you know, throughout all of this, I certainly continue to get uh, feedback uh, from parents and teachers um, and folks all over the community um, because we know how central our schools are um, to the vitality of our community. People need to have kids in school. Number one, um, kids, their emotional and social development depends on their ability to interact with their peers, um, interact with teachers and other adults and see their counselors and take advantage of services that exist in our schools. Um, we also know that it's critical for our schools to be open so that our parents can engage full time in work opportunities. So the flow of our economy is connected um, to our schools. And we certainly don't take any of those responsibilities um, lightly. Um, we're gonna do everything we can to make sure we open our schools as fully as possible. Uh, come August, um, August 19th the date, but it'll be somewhere around that time frame. But um, let's be clear, we will open schools um, in August, and it's my hope that we can open them to the broadest degree. Uh, we'll continue to have these conversations um, before we make a final um, decision on this. Thank you so much, Dr. Renzi, and for that very, very, very valuable information. We're going to go now over to President Hill, and he's the president of Brara College with so many locations here in our local community. President Hill, could you go ahead, sir, with your introduction? Yes, thank you very much. First, thank you, Sean, uh, and thank you, Mr. Mayor, for creating this platform for so many folks to get to learn about what's going on in our community. And of course, Superintendent Runcy, it's always a pleasure, um, and certainly a pleasure when I get to, to sit next to you, even if it's virtually. Um, so for those who, who don't know, uh, I'll give you a little bit of background on Broward College. We are 63,000 students strong. We are usually about one of the top 10 largest institutions of higher education in these United States. And we are an open access institution. That means if you have a high school diploma, we want to make sure that you know that you are welcome to come to us. We also an incredibly affordable institution where the average credit is about $85 per credit. And when you can compare that to most institutions, you see that is an incredibly affordable rate. We've been recognized nationally for how affordable we are. And of course, we've been recognized nationally because when a student graduates from Broward College, they graduate with very little, very little, if any debt whatsoever. Um, but of course, one of the more pertinent parts of our work is that when students come to us, they know that they're going to move through efficiently in an affordable way to either transfer to a university or move directly into the workforce. And when they're moving directly into the workforce, that may include getting a certificate that you can get in a matter of weeks or months. It certainly can mean an associate's degree, an associate degree of science that can get you a very high paying job, and certainly a baccalaureate degree in science as well. All of our programming being designed to get people great jobs with high pay upon graduation. We're an incredibly diverse institution. We have over 150 countries of origin represented among our student body over 50 languages represented among our student body. And then among our 5,000 employees as well, representing globally our population. And we always focus on the passion that our faculty members bring as well as our staff bring to this institution, our students. And that probably couldn't be greater depicted than in the, uh, in the phases that we are now. As we looked at March 12th, which was our day of reckoning and deciding that we were going to move into a completely remote learning and remote working environment. Uh, not certainly to the scale of Superintendent Runcy, but it was certainly to a point where we knew that it would be a dramatic change for us, particularly when many of our faculty members had not had material exp uh, experience teaching online. And of course, many of our students didn't necessarily have a high level of comfort because we were still a little bit early in our conversations. We were actually able to conduct surveys with students and faculty 
and recognize about 70% of our students felt comfortable with the prospects of moving online. So we did that. It's been incredible, frankly, to see the response from our employees and our students. Our students, as we completed spring and we've seen some of the results, the students performed nearly just as well uh, as they did last year at this time. And that was an incredibly important part. Many of our students, again, coming from low income backgrounds, first generation students. So they're trying to figure it out. And our teammates did a fantastic job of helping them with that. We continue to be in a remote learning environment through the summer. And as we think about fall, and as Superintendent Runcy said, it's it's very uneven. You never know what's coming. Things change day to day, if not minute by minute. But at this point, we're looking at being, again, primarily remote in the fall, with the concept being that any classes that do not have to take place in a face-to-face -face format to be successful, we will maintain a remote environment for those courses. But if you're thinking about some of our technical programming, think about our automotive programming. Think about our nurse pro nursing programming that has labs that require face to face interaction or even our police academy programming. Many of our programs require face to face action interaction in order to be successful and that. Uh, plans out to about 10% of our overall classes. Now we have 3500 sections, so about 10% of those will be in a face to face environment, but we know that because the continuity has been exceptional and our faculty and our staff have been exceptional and of course, most importantly. Our students have continued to perform at a high level. We feel very comfortable with the remote environment for 90% of our classes and, of course, erring on the side of caution and safety, knowing that the academic continuity can be maintained has been pivotal. So we're excited about that. But of course, uh, it is an uneven road ahead and we try to make sure that um, we're responsive to whatever changes come forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. And we did uh, promise that we'll be taking questions from the audience and we've had a couple of feedback, but um, Dr. Renzi, we, when you spoke about uh, school and the survey that came from parents, you know, the, the concern is there for childcare and, and, and aspects of the, the school experience when parents get concerned. Can you talk a little bit, sir, about um, before care and after care? How will that work and how many days will the kids be in school and what can parents look forward to? Um, so again, our, our first um, decision point is to figure out, you know, how open are we gonna be when we return, right? Are we going to be 100%? Um, that's something that we are exploring. Um, or are we going to be in some kind of hybrid model where students are going, you know, two or three days a week um, and ensuring that at least 50% of their time they're on campus? And of course, we're regardless of what we do, fully open or hybrid model, we're going to have um, a group of students who are going to be learning from home in an e-learning format. Um, so we, we have to work through that as far as, um, child care, um, and before and after care. I mean, if we're going to open our schools, we're going to work with our, um, after care and before care partners to figure out how those programs can be implemented within the context of the environment, uh, that we'll have to create that puts, um, health and safety precautions at the forefront. Um, and that means, you know, the extra cleaning steps and activities that will need to be taken, um, the different protocols that we'll have to put in place, um, we'll have to factor um, all of those things in place. So relative to what happens with aftercare and before care, it's going to be, that's going to be led and driven by the decisions that we make on how the, 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 the school day itself is structured. And again, we hope to make um, some decision around that within the next um, couple of weeks. Um, next Tuesday is going to be a, a critical conversation point for us with our school board and community. And again, I will continue to stress that the survey information from our parents are absolutely essential to our decision making. The survey that's going out is, is yes, it's district wide, but it's very granular. We're trying to actually figure out what the requirements are and the preferences are at each individual one of our 236 um, schools, um, elementary, middle, high school, and center schools throughout um, Broward County. Thank you so much, sir. Can you speak a little bit also about um, sporting activities and how that will be handled when students return? Yeah, so uh, all of our sports and activities, whether it be athletics, um, it'd be cheerleading, band, um, a lot of those programs that we know give our kids meaning, purpose, 
um, excitement and engage them to come to school. Um, we intend to start those up in mid-July. Our um, athletics department has been working through uh, protocols. They're working with um, local uh, organizations. They're looking at national organizations such as the NCAA to see what protocols are happening there as well as our professional um, sports team. So it is our intent to um, open those activities back up. There obviously will be some initial restrictions on them and then we'll expand as we go along, but we know how critical those things are. And so our goal is somewhere around mid-July to begin to initiate um, those programs uh, within the district. Again, within a different set of guidelines that we'll have to put in place. And we're working to figure out what those are by looking at some of the best practices that are being deployed in professional sports, collegiate sports, uh, as an example, and working with our local um, officials. Mr. Runcy, Mr. Runcy, I received a few questions from the community uh, regarding um, or fully opening the schools at 100%. And what I've heard is that uh, you have one set of parents that feel that 100% fully open schools is best for the um, academic um, success for the child. And the other uh, set, of, set of parents more so lead towards, you know, I have to work. You know, I, I can't stay home. I'm a full-time employee or a business owner. Um, so can you talk about what would have to be in place for schools to open at 100% and perhaps touch on what are some of the concerns in terms of opening up fully as it relates to complying with CDC distancing guidelines? Yeah, so let me just say, if one has to add here to um, CDC guidelines as they have been put out, it'll be impossible to open schools fully. So let's be clear about that, right? So the other thing I'll tell you about the CDC guidelines, which is real interesting, uh, they use words, encourage you to do ABC, and then they end it with, if feasible, right? So those guidelines are not absolutes. Um, you know, and, and I, I've spent a lot of time talking to our local health officials, public health officials, um, medical experts as well, um, continue to get feedback. So um, we're dealing with obviously a very serious um, virus here and it has been having um, significant ramifications uh, locally as well as nationally and globally. So we need to keep that at the forefront. Um, but we do know that essential services do continue, right? The grocery stores continue to stay open, um, whether it, it's gas stations, um, you know, our health uh, care services uh, are in, some businesses are trying to figure out ways to do it. Um, and so we, you know, we'll need to wrestle with this and figure out, um, does that make sense? Again, this is why the survey data is so important because at the end of the day, um, yes, I will, you know, work with the board to make a decision that we know is in the best interest of our, our kids and our employees from the health and safety perspective. But, you know, we're here to serve our community. And if the vast majority of parents are willing to and tell us that, look, we understand the environment, we understand the risk, and we know there's data out there that seems to suggest there's a different impact on kids and so forth. Um, if they're willing to take all those things into consideration and say, I still want my child in school five days a week because the adverse impact of them not being in school is significant not only on the child, but on the family. And that's more significant than the risk of having them go to school. Um, we may then have to open school at 100% and let parents decide if they wanna go. Um, we already know based on a survey, and I hope the second survey will confirm that, that we are currently looking at only 75%, right? Of the um, parents, who may want to go to school full time or some hybrid model, right? And so the question is, how much of the safety protocols can we put in place in terms of social distancing and so forth? That might be pretty hard to do in some cases, but in many schools, I can tell you right now, schools that are at 55%, 60, and even up to 70% capacity can arrange things in their schools 
even using ancillary spaces, whether it be your gymnasiums and other areas, so that they can create more distancing um, among um, students and spread out a little bit more. Um, we certainly would consider and, and have to really think about protocols as such as um, having students also uh, wear PPE. Uh, would they have to do it all the time? I don't think it's realistic that they would, but in certain circumstances where you know you're you're riding on the bus um, or you're traveling, you know, and moving around on campus between classes, but um, so we're going to have to work through those. And of course, our employees, absolutely, the adults in the school, we're going to have to make sure um, that they are um, properly protected, um, that they have appropriate um, PPE. Um, we know for some of our schools, we're probably even going to have um, our, our teachers, um, you know, they may need, um, you know, face shields as well, depending on the environment and the students they're dealing with. So. Um, it's a long answer to basically tell you that that option of opening 100% is still on the table. We are seriously considering it, and we're going to continue to seek input from families to see how much of an appetite there is for us to do that, notwithstanding the conditions that we have out you know, in, in our community relative to the virus, et cetera. I Thank hope you. that gives you some, is that answered for you or? Yeah, I think I think it really does put into to context for those concerned parents that this is not a black and white decision. There are so many variables and especially in light of, you know, even today, uh, we broke as a state another record, 5,500 positive cases. And um, we're still learning what these impacts are on children. But what folks have to also realize that, you know, even though there may be less of an impact on children that may be asymptomatic, but they're going home to parents. They're going home to grandparents. Um, the teachers that they're interfacing with are now being um, exposed. So it's, it's a very complex um, situation. I think that your, your answer, um, even though it may not necessarily satisfy those who are adamant about a particular choice, but at least it gives some context in terms of all of the struggles you're dealing with from an administration standpoint to make a decision. Yeah, I mean, you said it so well. Uh, there's, um, yeah, there, there, there's, there's no easy answer for this, but I, what I want to be clear to the folks that asked that question, we haven't shut the door on that option occurring. We need to, we need to really just, again, think this through. Um, and it may be the way, you know, we have to go. Uh, and, and there may be things that change. I mean, we could have the pandemic extend and grow to an order of magnitude way beyond anything we've seen so far in this state. And if the governor says we have to close schools, we, we close schools, right? And so it, it's, it's all going to depend. But if things were as they are right now today, without any further um growth in cases yeah we 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 certainly um consider that the last thing i'll say about the young people because there's a there's some misinformation out there that so-called young people don't get the virus i continue to stay plugged in with our public health officials and i can tell you that so far since march since we've been doing testing we've had over 700 young people under the age of 18 test positive and the positivity rate is increasing among them that's one and and almost 65% of that number um, were identified in the month of June alone. So and the, and we also there have been um, very young children that has been severely impacted and and small numbers no. have um, died from this virus. So it's not true that students and you know young people are not impacted. So uh, parents need to not continue to listen to that. Although we we do know it is happening to a lesser degree. When they do get infected, their symptoms are not as significant. So that we know. But the point that you made about the teachers and the other employees, that is a big concern, right? And we have teachers and folks with all kinds of underlying health conditions. They're in different age brackets. And so we have to put an increasing priority to make sure at a minimum that they have substantial amount of protection and they have the confidence to be able to come into our schools because if I just have a small percentage of teachers that are impacted, they can't come, that has a significant impact on our ability to educate 
with the level of quality instruction that we desire for our kids. Thank you for the time to share that information. Uh, Dr. Ansel, thank you so much. And thank you, Mayor Mason. Um, we have quite a few questions sir, that are coming in on Facebook. Um, we are, we, I'm going to take this one with regards to virtual curriculum. So uh, somebody wants to know about the training of teachers because I, I guess as a parent, they experience some challenges with the, the closing of the last semester. So they want to know our teachers are going, our teachers going to be trained over the summer as a proactive measure to meet the new um, fall semester with uh, virtual education. Um, yeah, training our teachers over the summer. That's our on on, on practices around uh, online e-learning. That's our biggest priority training initiative over the summer. Big focus for us. Um, you know, we're we're also working um, to make sure that uh, we create um, mentors and other supports for teachers so we can accelerate um, the learning and a comfort level around this, but that that's our big priority this summer because we know going into the next year we have to be prepared for the unexpected um which and we know we're going to be doing some degree of online e-learning so all our teachers need to develop that skill set and um, that is the training for the summer and i know we're going to go on to um, uh, president hale with broward county uh, broward college with some exciting programs uh, but uh but Robert Aransi, can, can you just share with our parents that are online viewing this, uh, what are some of the steps in terms of how will you clean this facilities? What would that process look like in terms of disinfecting surfaces to ensure that um, the virus, uh, to limit the risk of the exposure? Yeah, so uh, we will essentially work to do um, different cleaning protocols throughout the day. High touch surfaces will be cleaned regularly. Um, we'll also work to do some um, deep, deeper cleaning uh, in the evenings every day. Uh, we may even engage some additional resources, some vendors outside the district um, to do some more extensive cleaning, even over on the weekends to the extent that we need to. Um, so um, cleaning priorities are going to be, be big. One of the, the good things as well is that we've also learned from uh, FEMA uh, that they will actually help cover additional um, cleaning um, strategies that we will do in a district above and beyond what we already do. So not to supplant what we do, but to enhance what we're doing. So the financial limitations that we would have, that barrier has been removed. So I can assure all parents out there, we're gonna take the most ex extensive and aggressive um, practices that we can in terms of cleaning. We're even, we've even acquired some new technologies, right? So some of the misting technology that you can use that will touch every single surface where you spray. Uh, we're currently working uh, with those on our buses as well as in our facilities. Um, and we're experimenting with other uh, cleaning uh, methods in our schools, but um, that's, that's gonna be a big high priority thing for us. Uh, thank you so much, sir. And, and as Mayor Mesa alluded to, we're going to take some questions for uh, President Hale, who's also on the line. Uh, President Hale, if you would, sir, please go ahead and talk to our viewers about what they can expect as we're talking about the fall semester. What can they expect about the fall semester at Broward College? Yeah, so the fall semester, I touched on this a bit earlier. What we are going to be doing is primarily remote learning uh, for the fall semester as we are doing the summer. Probably about 90% of our classes will remain uh, remote. And what we're looking at doing is having about 10% of our classes uh, be in a face-to-face -face environment. And those are basically the classes that have to be in a face-to-face -face environment in order to exist. Think about your technical training, automotive print training, some of our nursing programs, uh, uh, law enforcement programming, anything that has to be in a face-to-face -face environment to be successful, we're doing that. And of course, we feel comfortable doing that, not only because we're erring on the side of safety and caution, but because of the academic continuity and the success rates that we've seen since moving to a remote environment uh, for the spring and through the summer. Uh, through the summer. Okay, thank you, sir. And if you could talk to us about uh, programs that are available to during this time when individuals are losing their jobs and we're in a COVID-19 situation, um, are there any programs and services that are um, offered by Broward College that would allow them to further education for, you know, free or, or any kind of um, 
relief that they can get on that end. Yes, no, of course, Sean. So, so one of the things um, I'm delighted to talk to you all about is uh, what we have in terms of expanding our business model at Broward College called Broward Up. Um, one of the things that we recognize and we have been working towards this over the last couple of years now is that regardless of the affordability of Broward College, regardless of the access uh, to, uh, of Broward College in terms of only needing a high school diploma, there are still far too many people who don't get the opportunity to engage. Maybe it's because they don't have the transportation to get there, or maybe they don't have the technology infrastructure, or frankly, maybe they don't have the time because they're working multiple jobs and they have to make sure that they take care of their kids and, and managing the challenges of particularly of, of COVID-19. And I'll, I'll start with one data point for you all. The uh, chairman of the Federal Reserve Chair Powell uh, recently shared that about 40% of those in this country who make $40,000 or less have lost their jobs during this pandemic and economic recession. That is a horrifying number. And so one of the things we all have to do, and certainly Broward College needs to do we help those individuals rebound. Certainly those individuals live in Broward County. Certainly they live in the great city of Miramar. One of the things that uh, I always talk about is the reality that we are incredibly affordable. Well, you can see the, the, the cost there. And most of our students, just like I was, are Pell Grant recipients. That means they can get Pell Grants that offer the opportunity to school for free that we're up against and what we're going to do to address and what we are doing to address it. 50 years ago, the top 25% of income earners had 40% of their kids going to college and the bottom 25% had 6% of their kids going to college. I take you to today, the top 25% of income earners has gone from 40% to 77%. And of course you wanna see growth, but the part that's abhorrent to me is that we see 6% of the bottom 25% of income earners only going to 9%. And that is the problem. That is the inertia that we have to address at Broward College and beyond. So what we've been focusing on is notwithstanding the fact that we have 63,000 students, let's identify the communities that have the lowest college attainment rates. That is, they don't have certificates and they don't have degrees at a high rate and also high unemployment. And we know that there's only about 3,000 students from those most challenged zip codes in Broward County, and that's unacceptable. We also know that when we look at the most challenged zip codes, that we need to improve the degree and certificate attainment. Only 27% of the residents of those most challenged zip codes have a certificate or degree. And finally, we are taking responsibility for moving folks up the income ladder. If you come to Broward College and you're in the bottom 20% of income earners, and when you leave Broward College, you're in the same space, then we've done nothing. We have to take responsibility for moving folks up the income ladder. And of course, your Miramar residents will recognize this zip code. Now, importantly, as bad as these numbers may seem from an unemployment rate perspective, this was at a time when the unemployment rate in the county was 2.5%. This is pre-COVID. And so we're still trying to extract the numbers in a post-COVID environment, but we know countywide, it's about a 14% unemployment rate. And whenever we look at our most challenged zip codes, most of our minority zip codes, we're talking about at least double or triple those rates, which is why we have to be incredibly aggressive about providing post-secondary opportunity because post-secondary opportunity leads to higher income, lower unemployment. And if you are unemployed, it helps you get out of unemployment quicker. So here's what we did at the college. When you look at the shaded blue areas, you see those zip codes that have the highest unemployment rates and lowest post-secondary attainment rates. And when you look at those dark blue dots, those are the locations of Broward College. Those are the brick and mortar locations as they were as of 2017 and 18. And we said to ourselves, we cannot be that distant from the people who need us most. We have to be in the heart of the communities that need us most to provide post-secondary opportunity. So we started with partnering with the Urban League of Broward County. And we partnered with them. They are extraordinary partners, of course. And we asked them, do you have space where we could be in the heart of the community that needs us most? And we are going to provide certifications and higher education opportunities for free in those communities. And the Urban League, of course, stepped up and said, we'd love to do that. We are welcome in our home. Let's make sure that we're in the heart of the 33311 zip code, one that needs us significantly. 
we started to do this even more aggressively, not just the Urban League, but you can see the list of nonprofit organizations that we are now partnered with to, again, provide post-secondary education in the heart of those communities that need us most. If you're typically would have to take two buses to get to us, that's unacceptable. We want to make sure that we're down your street or at your neighborhood organization, and even more so, and this is where I have to show tremendous appreciation for May and Messam and his team for allowing us to be in the city of Miramar, what we started to do was let's look at cities and municipalities and say they know their citizenry, they know their challenges. Would they be willing to open up their doors so we can provide post secondary uh, education in the heart of those uh, communities that need us most? And you can see there in the bottom right of that left panel, the city of Miramar again, I'll be forever appreciative of your willingness to open up your doors so that we can serve your constituents with post secondary opportunity. And you can see the bubbles where they are. But here's probably the most salient point. In 2017 and 18, you looked at where we were compared to where we needed to be. One year later, we were able to add eight locations by way of these partnerships that we've described. And you take us to today, we were able to add a, an additional 15 partnerships to provide post-secondary opportunity in the city of Miramar and other cities that need us most. Here's just a quick sampling of these programs. Importantly, these are programs that lead to great jobs and a lot of them are short-term programming. So when you think about those 40% of individuals who make 40 grand or less, they don't necessarily have the time to spend two years or four years to get a degree, but they probably have the time, particularly if they've been furloughed, to get to spend a few weeks or a few months getting a certificate that can get them a great job. Thus far, since launching Broward Up and changing our business model, we've served over 1,625 residents in those communities that need us most. And what's also critical about this number is of that 1,625, 400 have been since the pandemic. That is when people have been laid off, when people have lost opportunities, we've jumped in and said, you've been dislocated from your employment. Let's create an opportunity for you to use that time productively, as you mentioned, Sean, and get a certificate that can change your life. And this is what changing lives looks like. This was Denise. Denise lost her job and she was able to go to one of our Broward Up locations and get a post-secondary certificate here in supply chain management. She actually went back, her employer had been acquired, which was why she lost her job. She went back to the new employer that had acquired her company and said, I got this certificate from Broward College and what can, I, what can it do for me? Can I do anything with you? And they created a position and hired her on the spot and agreed to pay her $50,000 a year that is the power of making sure that we are where we need to be. And I am proud again, Mayor Messam, to your staff for allowing us to be in your community. Uh, thank you so much, President Hale. And as you mentioned, Mayor Messam, I'd give the mayor a chance now to talk about the, the relationship between the Broward Up program and the city of Miramar. Mayor Messam, if you would go ahead, sir, and give your, your remarks on that. Yes, we're very excited, the city of Miramar. Um, at our last commission meeting last week, um, the Miramar City Commission uh, passed the Memorandum of Understanding uh, with um, Broward College, which officially links us with the Broward Up program. And we'll have, um, we'll provide facility space for residents in the 33023 zip code. Um, that is the zip code that President Hale just identified in terms of some of our most depressed areas. And what's so wonderful about this opportunity is that, you know, if you're a person who may be um, unemployed, underemployed, this is an opportunity for you to assess the programs that are being offered, um, obtain a certification or some skills um, that will increase your employability or a job that's paying you more. That's what it's really all about for you to earn more, to be able to take care of your family, to have the quality of life um, that you envision for yourself and for your families. And we'd like to thank uh, President Hale and Broward College um, for making this uh, available, to having the foresight to understand that there are some access barriers, some access challenges um, for, for residents. And once you give residents an opportunity to improve themselves, they'll take advantage of it in the city of Myanmar can you uh, cannot be more excited to be a part of this. Thank you so much, Mayor Messam. And, and we have quite a few more questions on Facebook um, for Superintendent Runcy, but, but Mr. Hale, I wanted to ask you, sir, before we move on, um, one viewer wanted to know if Broward College helps with employment if students receive a certificate. So either, you know, assist in the job placement um, yes. aspect of that. Could you talk a little bit about, about that, sir? 
Yes, absolutely. So that is fundamental to this programming to make sure, one, that the programming leads to a workforce need that currently exists. But two, we are in partnership with employers who are looking for these certifications. And they also want to be able to tie this, the individuals who attain those certifications to their employers. So that is a critical component of this. We'll continue to grow that component of it as well. As well. In fact, you should know that the city of Miramar has also um, really been leading a big a part of that discussion is tying the employee employer opportunities to these certifications and to potential employees or residents. So great question. It is a critical component of this work as well. Awesome. President Hale, can you speak to in terms of the availability of, of these of, of the training? So for example, our thought process is that you know we would want these programs to be available perhaps in the evening or perhaps even on weekends so it's more accessible for residents. Um, can you share with the viewers in terms of how the program works under those environments? Absolutely. So let me let me start with the audience that we're we're talking about here. Many of our students are are uh, certainly older adults, um, think 20s, 30s, 40s, and above. We even have graduates who, we, we, I kid you not, we had a graduate last year who was in her mid-70s uh, from Broward College. And so when you're talking about an older audience, you're not talking necessarily about providing programming during the day when they might be working. That means that you're talking about providing programming in the evening. That means you're talking about providing program programming during the weekend. And, and, and probably the most fundamental part of this is that oftentimes you see programs that bounce in and out of communities. Maybe we say, hey, come downtown from Lauderdale for a weekend, or maybe we say we show up uh, for one weekend and who knows when we'll be back. This partnership is about meeting the needs of the local community. When is the best time for us to be there? When are the best act? Where's the best location for the best access point? This is again about embracing the challenges of our audience and making sure that we are there to accommodate them. Certainly, there's an online component to them, which we're leveraging right now, particularly in this COVID-19 environment. But then, you know, recognizing that a lot of our students are doing online work between 10 at night and 2 in the morning, and that's okay. We need to be available when those students are available. So thank you for raising that, Mr. Mayor. And as we continue to work through that, we'll make sure we're available when your residents are. Thank you, sir. And somebody wanted to know if there will be additional programs that will be added to Broward up in the future, you know, like additional certificate programs. Yes, absolutely. So one of the things that we do, it's actually ties to your uh, audience members earlier questions. One of the things that we think about is what are the needs if there are businesses in that community and they have specific needs that need to be satisfied, we will develop programs to actually meet that need so that the residents of the city of Miramar in this example don't necessarily have to go much further than their own community if we know that employers have a need and we can provide the pipeline and certification that satisfies the needs of that employer. So yes, the answer is yes. It's all about making sure we're meeting the workforce need and whatever certifications need to be in hand to do that, we are in the process, we would be developing them. Thank you so much, Mr. Hale. And I, I, we're going to be going back to Dr. Runcy, but there are so many questions for him and I know you have a hard deadline. So right now I might ask you if there's anything else that you wanna share with the audience that we have not asked in questions so that you know when we're entrenched in the, com in the conversation about our public schools, then you know we, we understand your timing. Sure, and I'll just say I'm just as entrenched in the public schools. I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old, and I'm I'm excited by what I'm learning, Superintendent Runcie. So thank you very much. I'll make sure to relate to to my wife Shay. Um, but but beyond that, I, I just want your audience members to know that our doors are open. Um, uh, we embrace you, whatever your challenges are. We want you to make sure that you know that the opportunity exists with Broward College. We are here to accommodate. We understand. There are unique challenges right now that the world is facing and individuals are facing. So don't hesitate, don't have fear, raise your hand, give us a call. You should know that we're available and here to assist you. And I thank you for the opportunity to share this. We really appreciate that, sir. And, and Mayor Messam, is there anything that, that you'd like to add on our adult education aspect before we move back to our public? Yes, I'm really excited about uh, this partnership. And in the city of Myanmar, we're currently having conversations with our current business uh, businesses in the city of Myanmar. Uh, many of the viewers may not know that Myanmar has more Fortune 500 companies than any city in the Tri-County area, along with a ton of mid-sized and small businesses. So we're already talking to them about how are they surviving and how are they uh, preparing their workforce in this new gig economy. 
And we see a perfect relationship with Broward College and being able to tailor um, some programs to help keep our local businesses you know, competitive because we want them to be around today. We don't want them to be disrupted by some other new technology or new other company that displaces them. We want them to be on the top of the food chain. So with collaborations and partnerships with Broward College, as well as with our local public schools, um, will position us to be able to show these corporations that we do um, ensure that we have a great pool of employees that are in the pipeline being developed, being trained, and have the skill sets to make them successful. Thank you so much, Mia Messam. And Dr. Runcie, sir, we're going to take some of the additional questions that we did get from our viewers. I want to start with the question of school buses. And when, while we talk about social distancing, we understand the challenges that that can pose. So one viewer wanted to know, will there be additional buses being put on the routes so that we can adhere to social distancing while transporting kids to school? Uh, no, we have a limited number of buses. We have maybe about 1,200 buses in Broward County. Uh, and what I can tell you is that, you know, we, we can't just go out and buy buses as you would buy cars. You have to order, order them with a lead time of as much as um, six to eight months. Um, so that's not going to be a possibility. Uh, and obviously, there's, you know, you have to get drivers and so on and put all of the other pieces in place. Um, so what will happen is, you know, we, we may end up having a situation where, um, you know, some parents may decide to drive their kids to school, um, transport them some other way. Others may decide to, you know, obviously put them on the buses. We're going to have to put up, figure out some protocols to make that work. But we have a finite set of buses and drivers that we can um, have, and we need to have some type of um safety protocols in place for for the buses and we'll have to go and, and figure that out and that can be everything from you know spacing out in a bus it could be every other seat um in addition to that wearing masks and doing temperature checks we are exploring all of those um pieces um as requirements that will be integrated into our transportation strategy um, thank you thank you sir um, there's this question that i, I kind of want to summarize for you as you talk about the virtual learning combined with the classroom learning, while children are out of school, they're interacting with, you know, other children, and then they come back and then they interact with the group that they're with and school in that day. And I think what this parent is trying to get to is what precautions are being taken for, you know, assessing these participants to make sure that we're not having the spread of the virus when kids interact with other folks and then come back to school. I mean, there are going to be the typical um, guidelines that we have received from public health officials and CDC, uh, which is, you know, if, if a child or any adult or anyone is um, is, is symptomatic, um, they will be immediately isolated. Uh, we will call the parents to come and pick up um, their child. Um, they will have to be, you know, quarantined for some period of time and we'll have to be um, um, tested and, and provide um, evidence that, you know, they, they certainly have um, recovered from that. So um, th those, are, those are the protocols we're going to have. And, and let's be clear, no matter what we do, whether we have kids coming some days and not others, and some come in every day, the virus is going to spread. It's going to happen. And then we are going to have infections. And so we're going to put protocols and steps in place to be able to isolate that and deal with it and make sure that we contain and manage it to the greatest degree possible. But there's nothing we do that's going to be risk free um, at any level. So I, I just want to be clear about that. Thank you, sir. And I really appreciate that. Um, taking another questions and I'm taking them in rapid succession just to try to see if we can get through as many of them okay. as possible. If we're moving to a virtual learning uh, situation, what approach is being to initiate the instruction concerning the enrichment for gifted and high achieving students, as well as inter intervention with struggling learners who are in the same environment? Uh, well, we, we're going to have to continue to do what we have been doing. It's going to be obviously a little more challenging to do that, um, depending on the modality that we have, whether you're in school or you've chosen to do e-learning. 
will make it a little more challenging. But I will say that um, what we've been able to accomplish and see as an opportunity um, over the last several weeks of school is the opportunity to personalize instruction to an even greater degree. When you have um, teachers that are doing face-to-face -face online are able to now have um, office hours and more times to connect with students directly, um, that can be helpful. Look, there's no substitute for in-person um, uh, in school. That's what we all want. Uh, but we will continue to try to make sure that we per personalize the instruction, make sure that those students who um, are accelerating, that we continue to provide them those kind of opportunities. And that's what we've tried to continue to do throughout uh, Broward, whether we have students that are part of just our general education, our special needs students, um, those that are in gifted accelerated programs, we're still going to have those programs in place. We're still gonna have certified gifted teachers available. We're gonna have certified um, ESE um, teachers and staff available. Uh, we're gonna make sure that our students who have fell behind because of what we call the COVID slide and the summer slide where they typically lose some ground our strategy this fall when we open has got to be not just about remediation, it has got to be about acceleration and getting our kids caught up. So our academics department, our schools, they're working through um, strategies to be able to provide um, the level of interventions and supports um, and extended learning opportunities for our kids that we know that they're going to need to catch up. Um, you know, even over the summer, we've sent out over 240,000 books. Um, to our kids in our early primary grades, just to make sure that they will have uh, books in their homes that they can continue um, to develop the love of reading and develop their literacy skills. Um, so we're going to continue to do everything we can to make sure that um, you know our kids are aren't going to fall behind. Thank you, sir. Mandy, did you want to say something? Sir? Yeah, Mr. Runcy, can you touch on in terms of what will be? Uh, cafeteria or the feeding process look like? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Given the the requirements that we have, there there could be a number of scenarios. We haven't decided on that, but we could end up with one scenario where students uh, are eating in their classrooms. So the the historical, the traditional thing that we've had, where you know you see the cafeterias just packed with hundreds of kids. Um, we're not going to be able to do that. So we're going to have a new strategy for feeding where students may have to um, go and retrieve their lunches and and have their lunches in their classrooms or in areas where we can at least maintain some type of um, social distancing or reduce the density of the areas that they're in. Um, but the traditional classroom environment, it just it won't be there, but we'll still obviously continue to feed our kids. We know how important that is. Um, I can tell you over the period where we closed our schools from March 13th to the end of the school year, uh, we served over 2 million meals um, to our children and families at uh, 49 sites. Uh, we are continuing our feeding programs over the summer. Uh, we've also received um, uh, support from partners, uh, including Miami Dolphins and others. Um, you know, the, the Florida Panthers have always been a big partner of ours, uh, but just a lot of support to help make sure that we not only are feeding our students, but we're also able to feed the adults in the family. Um, so feeding is going to continue. Uh, thank you, Dr. Runcie. Um, so, sir, I, I think this question had, from this viewer has to do with parents just feeling overwhelmed with the workload that their children have to go through understanding that, you know, they have full-time jobs and they're trying to help the children. So this question has to do with whether or not the, the, the distance learning can be structured a little differently to be a little bit more simplified and effective. Are there resources that parents can reach out to if they're having some challenges going through this coursework with their child? Uh, great question. So we have certainly learned um, over the last 12 weeks of schools, one of the big takeaways I've heard from parents and teachers um, is the need to not only support our teachers and our students, but we have to actually provide support and greater support and guidance to our parents um, as we go through this. So uh, we will be providing uh, more resources, uh, more opportunities to um, engage and support 
our parents because they have now become a very greater partner, if you will, in the education process. And a lot of those things we'll have to do and deliver them through our local school. So yes, we recognize that's a challenge. Um, we're, we're compiling and putting together more resources and supports for parents when we open in the fall. Um, so you can expect to see some of that. And, and I do want to continue to recognize and thank our parents for um, just working with us through these um, unchartered um, journey that we're on. I know it's been enormously difficult for many of them to try to juggle these educational responsibilities on top of everything else they're trying to do and um, the stresses that they have. Um, we, we're very cognizant of that. Thank you so much, sir. I want to add this question that came in from this viewer to the comments you just gave us. Uh, is there any change in the approach to standardized testing, seeing that the, these kids are le learning virtually and parents, you know, are so much more involved? How does that look? Uh, we're working through that with the um, state of uh, Florida, the, you know, for the state mandated assessments. As you know, they were relaxed um, this past year. Uh, we would expect that there's some allowances for them uh, this year, but look, we, we need to make sure that we continue to keep those standards at the forefront. Um, and we do our very best to make sure that our kids continue to learn and develop so that they can be uh, competitive and be successful, uh, not only in the education process, but they're also gonna develop the life skills that they need. Um, so we are not sure yet what modifications may be made to the standards we would await um, direction from the state on that uh, we will be advocating and lobbying for uh, modifications to that that recognizes the moment the moment that we're in and that our focus needs to be less on the assessment itself and more on the true learning that the students are going through and as long as we've put things in place and we can see that the student is learning, they're accelerating, there's growth there. Um, that's what we need to focus on. Thank you so much, Dr. Renzi. And um, I, I think that, Mayor Messam, I'm not sure if you have any other comments, sir, that you want to talk about some of the questions. I think we're, you know, we could combine two in one, and I know we're at that 7.30 mark. So, sir, I don't know if you want to give us any comments I, on any questions. I, I do want to mention one. Just one other thing, um, and it's related to, you know, the last question and the assessments. One of the things that we do know um, that we are um, putting a lot of investment and resources in is um, social, emotional learning and mental health, right? And we know if we aren't addressing the stresses and challenges that our students have, it becomes very difficult for them to learn in any situation, whether it be online, it's in person, sitting in a classroom. Um, so we'll continue to provide um, social, emotional learning, mental health supports, and we're gonna actually step those up and integrate the, that to a more extensive uh, manner um, in this coming school year. Thank you so much, Dr. NC. Uh, Mayor Messam, we got a little bit of static there. I'm not sure if you're hearing me. Just wondered if you have any more questions. I tried to combine questions because of our time frame for Dr. Nancy. Not sure if you have a question. Yeah, I just have uh, two quick questions. Uh, the first is, uh, can you share with our parents uh, who may have special needs kids? Obviously, these kids can't take uh, online courses. What accommodations and what will school look like for them moving forward? Well, I will tell you that the priority for us is that uh, for, for those students, especially those um, who are in some of our self-contained um, or need direct services, um, we're making the priority that they have to be um, in school on our campuses. And we just have to make it a priority um, that those students are with their teachers because there's really no effective way for us to achieve that goal of equity and opportunity if they don't get to be in a classroom. So our goal is to make sure that um, they are a priority for us. And the second question is, I know that, um, that in terms of preparing our 
community uh, for school in this new environment. It's not an easy task. We have so many stakeholders. We have so many um, um, desires from different stakeholders, and it's a very emotional process. And um, and I know that this is not um, your first challenge um, in terms of what you've um, been able to um, deal with successfully moving through um, your tenure as superintendent at Broward Schools. So my question to you is, what? How can we help you as a city? How can we help you as a community? Um, I know everyone is always looking to you and looking to your administration in terms of answers and solutions, but what can the city of Myanmar and, um, and the other 30 municipalities in Broward County do to assist um, our school board as well as yourself and your administration and our teachers during this process? Yeah, and I, I think there, there's probably a number of areas. Uh, I think one of them, is helping to ensure that um, there's great childcare opportunities um, throughout the city. So I think expanding um, childcare options that are available uh, within your cities are gonna give parents a lot more flexibility in terms of what they, they wanna do. I think that's a, that's a big um, piece of it. Um, you know, we have certainly had worked um, quite a bit in terms of um, helping to expand uh, literacy programs in partnership with municipalities. So we still, you know, we still need volunteers and, and folks to uh, come and work with our kids, even if that's done uh, remotely. Um, but I think the child care piece is, can be a, a big impact area. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with that one to, to work on. <laughs> all right, all right. Yeah, there's, yeah, you know, I, I think we, we, we've got to kind of settle in on, you know, a decision on what it's going to look like when we open school. And then I, we intend to then reach out to um, your great city as well as the League of Cities and others and have a conversation and say, here's, you know, where we are, um, you know, where can the city help us to better um, address any needs and challenges that our, our families are going to have. And then you guys have been, a, and let me just say that the um, city of Miramar has been a great partner um, in so many um, areas. Uh, you know, when it comes to school safety, for example, you're one of the, um, the cities who have put um, school resource officers in every um, uh, school that we have. And, and they really work to um, not only make our schools safe, but develop really good, positive relationships with our kids. And in this day and age where we know the, tension that's growing between um, our law enforcement agencies and communities. Um, I think the school resource officer program is a great place to start to begin to, met, to, to, to mend and build a positive uh, relationship between um, our law enforcement entities and our communities and, and starting with our, our children in a, at a younger age. Yes. We, yeah, we definitely uh, pride ourselves in terms of providing that, that resource uh, to all of our public schools. In fact, we took it a step further and also provide a, a school resource officer to our, to our uh, the schools that are charter schools in our city as well, because it is very important to us. So, uh, yeah, we, and, and, yeah, and, and just one uh, last thing, you know, we, although we do have our, our feeding programs, um, we know that the need continues to grow. Mm -hmm. Um, in every one of our cities and to the extent that I know the city of Miramar is um, certainly doing some of that, but, you know, continue to provide whatever programs and resources you can to our families, because when we know that our families are being taken care of and their challenges are being addressed and mitigated, that that's going to help our students to be in a better situation as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor Messam, and thank you, Dr. Renzi. And Dr. Renzi, as we wrap up today's session, sir, uh, just any final words you have for parents or educators that are watching this afternoon before we, we wrap up our session, we'll give you the opportunity to do that right now. Yeah, I, I know there's a, there's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of um, stress out there just, you know, because of, you know, where we, where we are. Um, I will say that our focus is we have to figure out a way that we can open our schools and be able to accommodate the needs of our community, both those that want to continue with e-learning and may stay at home, 
as well as those who want to send their um, children to school 100% of the time. We've got to figure out how we can make um, all that happen. Um, and, you know, nothing's going to be ideal. Um, so we, you know, ask for uh, patience and grace as we go through this um, and just know that we're trying to make decisions and work in a way that's best for your children because, because they're our children as well when they come through our doors. And I can tell you, when I, even when I look at our entire um, leadership team for the district and even down to our, you know, our school leaders, they have children, they have family um, who are in our school systems. So whatever decisions we make, we're all impacted um, by it. And so we're gonna try to make sure we do what's the absolute best for our community in a less than ideal situation. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we'll go right now to Mayor Messam. And Mayor Messam, you gave your, your uh, final comments for this afternoon, sir. Yes, I just would like to thank all the viewers for tuning in this evening for this episode of Conversations with Mayor Messam. I extend my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to Superintendent Robert Runsey and President um, Greg Hale for giving us some valuable information. Um, as I always like to conclude these uh, conversations with um, just with a message with the community, um, nothing is more important than our next generation, than our children, our seeds. Um, they are the most precious commodity a community has. And um, this is a very large undertaking, undertaking to ensure that we can continue to educate our children with in a high class manner, but also keep them safe. And we're trying to keep them safe um, against the moving target. There are so many unknowns, there's so many variables, and there's not going to be one ideal solution. So this is the time when the community really needs to come together. And I appreciate the process that uh, Superintendent Brunsey and his team is going through with the school board members. I know we have um, our own school board member, Patty Good, who's on, on, on one of the viewers on Facebook, um, who is one of uh, Mr. Runsey's bosses, and they have a tough ch chore ahead of them, and it's not an easy de um, decision. And whatever decision is made, there are going to be some folks that can live with those decisions. There are going to be some folks that may be disappointed. What I would ask the community to do is for us to galvanize around our leadership, uh, because we, we just through this process, um, there's community input, there's been one workshop, another workshop coming forward, and it's a very transparent process with input from the community. And I thank everyone for, participate, for, for participating in the survey so that Robert Runcie and his team and the school board can, can hear your voice. And um, the city of Miramar, we're here to support the school district in whatever decision that is made, because at the end of the day, this is a very serious virus and our children must be protected. We have to continue to educate our students, but we must educate them in the safest way possible. So we'd like to ask the community just to be supportive um, of this process um, so that we can do everything that we can to support our school district, to support our local schools, um, for your neighborhood school, check in with the principal and see how you can volunteer. As uh, Mr. Runcy stated, there are so many needs um, that are needed. Um, the city of Myanmar currently right now our daycare services are not available um, we're, we're analyzing when we will reopen and how we can safely do so but knowing that this is a great need in the community will be one of those factors that we will consider to see how we can do so safely because we know that the more resources we can make available to the public the better it's going to be for our children so thanks everyone again for tuning in this evening uh, this was a wonderful and a very um, high high pace on um, discussion. And I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Runsey for being in the hot seat and providing a lot of information for our community. Um, I've seen some of the uh, some of the comments on social uh, social media on Facebook um, saying how appreciative they are uh, for this discussion and, and, and bringing this topic to them. So I'd like to uh, bid everyone a good evening. We'll see you in two weeks. Um, we'll be talking about our upcoming hurricane season. I know we uh, tend to have forgotten about uh, hurricane preparation, but we're already 
a month, almost a month in, we've already had several named uh, storms, and that is another dilemma that we have to prepare for in a COVID-19 environment. So we'll look forward to bringing some valuable information to you in two more weeks. Thank you so much, Mayor Messam, and thank you to Dr. Runcie and President Hale for, for uh, joining us today. Most importantly, thank you to our viewers. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the interaction. Like the mayor said, we had a very robust conversation. But we want to let you know that for the latest information on the city of Miramar's coronavirus activities, please visit us at miramarfl.gov slash coronavirus or follow us on social media at City of Miramar. We want to let you know also that you can go to our website and sign up for a weekly newsletter that will be delivered right to your inbox at miramarfl.gov. This is a method that we use to provide you with the most up-to-date information from the federal government, from the state, county, and of course, local activities here in the city of Miramar. Until we meet again, thank you and stay safe.